thank you for uh, joining us this afternoon. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, things that a lot of the supporters and, and staff as well um, are looking to get some clarification on. So thank you for your time. Um, can you start by explaining your role at Charlton at the moment and, and indeed over the last few months? Sure. Well, first of all, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, hopefully, hopefully we can clear some of uh, the unclear aspects in what's happening right now at, uh, at the club. Um, my former role is that of a club director, uh, same, same as, as Claudio's. Um, but to be honest, uh, what we've done since, since March was simply um, very, providing a very broad oversight on, on the bigger things, the bigger issues in, inside the club. Uh, in our opinion, every every department in the club, especially the academy and the first team department, are very very well run, and everyone at the club is very professional. They know exactly what to do. So what what they need is is just have some uh, uh, some heading. Um, during the recent uh, the recent events. I've become a little bit more more involved in in the possibility of uh, of a takeover on on facilitating any any due diligence process and I'm going to explain briefly exactly what uh, what these what this means um, every time you buy something unless it's new you need to have a form of due diligence well actually sometimes even if it is new you know you want to compare features prices and and so on Mm -hmm. uh, let's just think of you know when you're trying to buy a used car. You know, you you look at the ad, you 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 have an idea of what 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 the guy is selling, but you still want to go look look at it for yourself. You want to look through the service book, maybe maybe take it to a mechanic. As the thing you're trying to buy gets more expensive and more complicated, so does the due diligence uh, becomes a little bit more complicated. So when you come to a, com a complex transaction like like a football club, you have two aspects. You have to do diligence and the commercial the commercial aspect. The commercial aspect is basically deciding how, when to buy, and in what conditions. This is always done, you know, by by the owner between the owner and the guy, the person who wants to who wants to buy. The due diligence is is the more complicated one. And it's done in in the case of a football club by the guys inside the football club and the advisors of the person who is uh, who is buying. So I'm involved in in the due diligence process. I help facilitate every any inquiry from any interesting party. And to put it broadly, my my job is to make sure that whoever is interested in the club gets all of the information he needs to remain interested and at some point go to the second phase, which is the, the, commercial, uh, the commercial side, the commercial aspect, to say so. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds like a simple question, but I mean, it has caused some confusion for some, but who currently owns Charlton Athletic? Charlton Athletic is, as far as I am aware, and as far as, far as my uh, as far as my understanding, is still being owned owned by a company called E Street Investments, which in turn is being co-owned by a company, the Abu Dhabi-based company Panorama Magic, and an individual natural person, Mr. Matthew Southall. So we're we're obviously at a stage at the moment where we're looking at. Um, a potential takeover from from more than more than one party who's in. Uh, Thomas Sangard has obviously come forward as the um, the front runner. I think it's fair to say at the moment. Um, at what stage are we at for for the sale of the not just to Thomas but to anyone? Um, I mean, how many parties are there? Can can we say how many people are involved? We've had we've had we've had several parties interested, uh, and you know once once a party enters into an NDA. Uh, they get access to some documents and then they start asking questions and asking for more documents. This usually depends on how invested that party is to actually buy, what expectations they've had, 
and also what advices uh, they uh, they have. Right now, uh, we are in a, in a, in an advanced due diligence process with just two two parties. We still have uh, NDAs with with others. We are still sharing information with uh, with others, but that uh, just two two parties who are up the front to say so. Um, one of them indeed is is Thomas Sangard, and the other one is. Um, an Istanbul-based uh, investment fund. Would it be fair to say, just because of everything that's happened at the club over the last, you know, not just the last six months, but but prior to that as well, that that due diligence process becomes a little bit more complicated than it might be at another club or or, or anything. Like you're making the comparisons of buying an item, even. Yeah, uh, I will just say that in the everything that's happened since January doesn't help doesn't ease uh the due diligence process indeed yeah um obviously one of the complications is this uh, injunction um from paul elliott um which i understand is being heard on on the first um can you explain a little bit about that what it means for the process um you know why it's come about if you mm -hmm. like i will i will do my best to to explain uh but i will ask everyone to please bear in mind if if you feel that there are bits missing on what I'm explaining, then that's because it's an ongoing legal procedure and there's a strategy, there's a strategy in place. So maybe at some point you, you will consider our reaction towards it a little bit disproportionate from, from the explanation you, um, you get. Um, an injunction, generally speaking, is a form of proceeding that, is seeking to prevent one party from from doing something. Um, in this case, Paul Elliott's company is seeking to prevent Panorama and Panorama only to um, dispose of of its shares in um, in ESI. Uh, indeed, the first hearing uh, will take place place uh, next week. And what can I say? It's uh, yeah, any anything you know. It's there is the possibility that that an injunction will be will be issued and that it will uh, it will prevent the sale. It could prevent the sale, but um, there are two aspects. Uh, on the first hearing, on the first hearing, you have the first hearing and then you have the returning uh, the returning date. So. These these are usually very close in uh, in in between. Uh, what's very important is the decision on the returning date. You may remember last year or two years ago there was a a, a bid for Bolton Wanderers. Yeah. And and the situation was more or less similar, and a party claiming to uh, to have a form of SPA in in place managed to get an interim injunction but he never got he never got the the, the actual injunction unfortunately for for Bolton from what I understood uh, they didn't have someone a, a buyer in place uh, at, at the moment so they didn't have someone who could just wait on on the injunction they were in the middle of the due diligence process and uh, that injunction scared everyone away um, in our situation Every party that has approached, uh, that has been interested in, in, in the club and has entered into an NDA, uh, was aware of the injunction, of the existence of the injunction on at, at the very moment. So everyone who is still continuing is continuing knowingly of, of the existence of the, of the ongoing uh, proceeding. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so we've established the ESI version one, if you like, um, uh, own the club. Um, obviously, Tanun Namir is is the um, majority shareholder of that. Uh, what's his involvement at the moment? Does he have any involvement, or is he sort of passing things on to be looked after? No, no, he doesn't have any any involvement. Um, we can consider him as a caretaker of uh, of the shares to say, to say so. Uh, if I may come a little bit back on 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 the injunction. Mm -hmm. uh, I need to make it very clear that 
there has been no court ruling um, since the application. Yeah, I've, I've seen some of the supporters who were very upset on how Paul Elliott was allowed to get an injunction. He, he didn't get it. He, he filed an application, which is the right of every, every person, you know, in, in a free country. Uh, and, and he got, and he got a date. Uh, the date that was set was through mutual agreement by two solicitors instructing barristers. Um, it wasn't dictated by any other provision or by the court. So it's, it was something obtained through, through mutual agreement. Right. So uh, just on the Paul Elliott situation, obviously the, um, the EFL turned down some initial, um, uh, you know, owners and directors tests, um, they initially failed. Um, and is there a process at the moment ongoing as to, as far as their appeal goes? I mean, obviously I think, I think we said that we, we wouldn't stand in their way or we couldn't stand in their way. How, how does that process work and what stage is that process at and, and what's the outcome one way or the other? Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, indeed, the appeal, like I said in a previous uh, interview, um, the application belongs to the individual. Uh, it's simply being, um, how can I say, simply being submitted um, through the club. Mm -hmm. Similar way, uh, the rejection also belongs to the individual and, you know, it has broader, broader effects. Because, you know, if you're disqualified when Charlton applies, applies on your behalf, you're going to be disqualified if two months later someone else uh, applies on your behalf. So this was the reason why uh, they, uh, they appealed. For example, we didn't, we didn't consider an appeal to be necessary for my brother, right. who was also part of, uh, of the ESI board back then. Uh, because of uh, the fact that appeals belong to the individuals, uh, the club is not uh, privy to, to these proceedings. Right. We will probably get a copy of the final of the final decision, so we do not know uh, if they are being if they have been set for for a date, if they will have a hearing, if they will simply review the documents and the uh, letters submitted on their behalf. So it's not too much information on that. So to, just to clarify, we, the EFL haven't given us any any time scale as to how long that might take yes that's correct cool um so we've talked about thomas sangard we've mentioned him um yesterday the name joseph Caller uh, came up um in in on social media um i guess it's fair to say um is there any truth in that in, in the uk based uh, consortium that's been mentioned if we can mention names Unfortunately, we can't mention names because of another reason. Uh, it wasn't a UK-based consortium. It was a UK-based agency. Right. Okay. Um, because, because that bid wasn't pursued, we didn't get to the chance, to the stage where we started asking who's involved, who's, you know, who, who's who. Right. Okay. So at this stage, it's not um, a name for fans to be concerned about. Is that fair to say? No, and, and I, I think uh, I got a lot of messages yesterday as well. And I think it, it caused a little bit of distraction. And I don't think we can all afford so, yeah. uh, so, so, so many distractions, you know? Yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, let's mention Matt Southall now as well. Um, as you mentioned, Tanoon has, has taken a back seat and, and, and handed things over to be taken care of. Uh, Matt's obviously still a... a a minority shareholder of ESI, but can you assure fans that he's, um, well, what, what, he, what is his role, if any? Indeed, he, he is a minority shareholder of uh, the, the company that owns uh, the club, but he has no involvement in the, um, you know, day-to-day um, -day running of, uh, of the club. Uh, I know there there have been some some issues last week or two weeks ago when it appeared as if he has instructed third parties to act on uh, on behalf of the club, but uh, that was cleared up with uh, with his solicitors. It was more or less like uh, uh, a confusion, and it's uh, uh, we get that sometimes it's uh, it's hard for everyone out there to to understand this, uh, you know complicated uh, corporate structure you know you have the uh, you have the football club you have ESI in between and then ESI is uh, has uh, has two shareholders but 
um, the company is always run uh, by the board of directors. You know, the shareholders only have authority in appointing the directors. And, you know, if hopefully, if hopefully the company is profitable, then they can uh, get their dividends. But uh, no, just because you have uh, uh, shares in BP, for example, doesn't give you the right to just step on an oil rig and uh, ask the guys to stop drilling or ask them to start to, to start drilling even harder. Exactly. Um, and so how does it work then with the day-to-day -day running? Who, who's directing traffic, if you like? Uh, more or less, it's, uh, it's, me, and, it's me and Claudio. Uh, but again, it's, it's more of an oversight. Uh, people inside the club are very professional about their jobs, very dedicated. They're really great people. So um, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We're not telling everyone how to do the, their job. We're just guiding them on the outcomes that uh, that we expect um another question i sort of almost hate to ask it because it's become a bit of a, another sideshow and another distraction but the, the situation around range rovers that keeps rearing its head and um, we know that you know there may be some that, that mr southall has we know that there was some that maybe paul elliott had or or whoever else is there any clarity on that um because, I mean, it is a significant amount of money, isn't it, that, that's, in, that's tied up in these cars and you know, who owns what and, and is there anything in place for retrieving any that are outstanding? Yes, unfortunately, these cars, and I'll, I'll have to admit, this is probably the strangest, um, the, the strangest, or one of the strangest bits in my tenure at, at Charlton. Uh, I, I sometimes joke to, to other staff members and other UK-based people uh, around the club and I always say, like, are you, you are aware that you know, cars are being made in other countries uh, <laughs> uh, as well. Unfortunately, uh, these cars were, um, they're not leased. They are on what you call hired to purchase. Yeah. So getting out of these agreements um, isn't as easy as it would have been if it were just a lease. Uh, we are doing our best to, um, how to say, to, to, to close these, this, this, these issues. But the most important, most important objective is to get out of the agreements, to get out of the, the liability. Because right now, um, it may not be the happiest solution. We may not be happy with it. But the liability isn't incurred by who exactly is, is driving them. Yeah, but it's it's being incurred by their, uh, you know, let's say very existence. Yeah. Okay. Um, so another key player, another another person to mention in this tangled web um, is Roland Du Chatelet, obviously the the former owner of the football club, but the current owner um, of the stadium and the training ground. Um, now, how how what part is that playing in in any processes going back and forth with potential owners? Because obviously the the, the, the 50 million pound uh, mark is obviously always mentioned when it comes to the deal, the original ESI deal. Um, is that, you know, a, quite a big hurdle when it comes to, to trying to complete any takeover? Right now, the remaining parties have not made uh, the takeover of, or a possible takeover of the club contingent on any position uh, from from Mr. Roland to Chatelet. So I, I, I can fairly say that right now he isn't, or his, let's say, landlord uh, quality um, isn't or wouldn't be an obstacle in, in the takeover. And my, may I add, um, tenancy, even in a, in a football club, um, isn't the end of the world. Uh, it's, it's being done in, in other places uh, in Europe as well. I, I know it's not a very popular uh, yeah. position in, in the UK and especially with, with Charlton fans. Uh, but I think in, in the club's current situation, uh, something like continuing to be tenants for a, couple, for, for a limited period of time wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be the... Uh, the end of the world you know it's a stadium uh the only the only tenant has to be a football club 
I felt there was such a big request for other football clubs to to play at the Valley because everyone has their their home ground. So I'm very confident that on medium and long term, uh, an agreement favourable for for the club for Charlton Athletic will be will be reached. So I guess that that's it, isn't it? The priority is the the stability of the football club and to to get any takeover over the line because anything involving the stadium is just going to take too long, I suppose. It's going to take too long. It's it's going to take a far bigger, uh, far bigger effort, especially especially financially. Um, the rent being charged isn't uh, isn't a burden. So I, I think we should just take every every breath of fresh air we uh, we can before uh, before embarking on this. I, I understand what what the valley means to. Uh, the fans, from from what I've I've been told, uh, they've took it back. Uh, they've took it back be, um, before in in the past. Uh, they've, from what I understand, they've all actually built or helped build part of uh, part of it. So um, I understand the frustration around it, but they also have to be aware of another thing that the uh, the stadium was split has been split from the club years ago. Uh, it, it wasn't an issue, or maybe no one took too much notice of it, because the owner behind the f- football company and the owner behind the holding company were the same. Yeah. But this this split, this division, has happened years before. I think uh, even before Roland Duchatelet ever became part of the club. So, with all this in mind, um, all the things we've discussed. Uh, injunctions, stadiums, and, and Range Rovers, and all that sort of stuff. What what is a likely timeline for, a realistic timeline for for getting a takeover done? Bearing in mind the the season starts, well, the league season starts September the twelfth. We've got our first cup game next week. Uh, with all that in mind, what what's the likely uh, timeline? Well, there will be two stages. Well, actually, maybe let's say three stages. One where a party would finish all of the due diligence and, you know, after consulting with its lawyers or other form of advisors, would say, okay, we're still interested. Uh, we haven't gotten to this formally with, uh, with anyone, but I wouldn't be very concerned because I think they was, today is the 25th. So uh, I don't think anyone has had two full weeks even, mm-hmm. you know, to, to, to work around the, the papers. Uh, then it should be it, they should reach an agreement like a commercial agreement with with the shareholders with both shareholders, and in the last stage they would make this agreement formal and you know make a timeline for the for the handover for the handover in uh, in place. Um, I know I know the season starts uh, on September twelfth. I know um, some parties are interested in in coming in before the season starts. But I would like to point out that another relevant date in, in all of this is also October 5th, when the transfer window closes. Yeah. And I think that if we get into an agree, if someone gets into an agreement in principle about the club, and even if the effective takeover cannot take, take place before September 12th, and it will take place between September 12th and October 5th, I am very sure and very confident that Steve Gallen and, and Lee Boyer, given the opportunity, uh, can patch up the squad in in a matter of days. They they have they have an eye for you know un, uncut diamonds, and I'm, I'm sure they can put something up at least the last to give us a fighting chance for the for the first uh, first part of the table until we reach the winter transfer window. Yeah, obviously, I mean, yeah, the, the transfer embargo is a, is a big issue at the moment, isn't it? With, as you mentioned there, with Lee and, and Steve trying to, to build something for next season, uh, for this season. Um, I mean, what details can you share about the transfer embargo? Because, I mean, there's some confusion over that as well, over what we're allowed to do, what we, what we can do. Obviously, we made two signings, but we had to sort of almost <laughs> beg for but the EFL to even allow us to do that. So... Who can we sign, and, and you know what can we do? It's true. It's true. We're not in the. We're not in the. We're by far in not in the best place right now. 
we are under what they call an absolute embargo. Right. Uh, we got the two exceptions for, for Washington and, and, and TLB. Because I can't give too much details, but there was a miscommunication at, at, at some point and um, DFL seemed fair and fit that uh, we, we, we granted these exceptions. The embargo was initially imposed on a matter relating the takeover proce- the procedure behind the takeover in, in January. Yeah. That was what they call a soft embargo. You just have to keep your um, wage levels yeah. constant. So, you know, someone leaves, you can only bring one guy on the same salary, two guys on half what the first guy was making and so on. Uh, now we are under an absolute embargo, what they call an absolute embargo. And I think that this expression speaks for itself. And this is tied to cash flow issues. The combination between the spending in the first half of the year doubled with the lack of, of investments slash injections caused a cash flow problem and DFL saw thought that it would be better to keep us from signing anyone to to preserve our our cash reserves. Because it's tied to money, uh, we're all very confident that you know moment money comes in or guarantees of, of money coming in, uh, this this should be resolved. Okay. Um, obviously, one of the, the the other questions is is around wages, and you know, in the past few months, has been concerns coming to the end of the month, whether or not the money is there or not. Um, without a new owner, how how you know how long does that go on for 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 being able to to almost get away with it? That I mean, I think you've already clarified that we're okay for for this month and hopefully September, um, but that can't be an indefinite solution, can it? Yeah, unfortunately, since since my appointment, uh, this this has been an issue. Uh, we've struggled ever since uh, ever since April. I know some some folks were saying that there's money in the club until Christmas. Uh, probably they were counting on the Easter Bunny to bring it, but <laughs> that wasn't uh, uh, that wasn't the case. Uh, yes, we've we've struggled to pay wages and and creditors. It's actually this this struggle that. Uh, caused us to be a little bit upset over the the Sheffield Wednesday um, yeah. situation, you know, because everyone we've all had our financial issues, and you know, we try to do the right thing, uh, respect our players, respect our staff, and respect our fellow football clubs to who who we owed money to. But uh, we pulled through uh, every month, mostly. Mostly with the help of other clubs, with the help of very dedicated staff, with a lot of understanding from government institutions. You're right. This isn't a this isn't a long term solution. Um, but what can I actually say, what can I also say is that we we haven't used the long term financial stability of the club of the club to finance its its current issues to be more explicit uh, we have not sold the sell on fees yeah possible sell on fees from 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 former players yeah so those those are still with uh, with the club I'm, I'm i'm sorry it's become an issue that needs to be clarified but uh, those uh, those are still with the um, with the club we are looking indeed at other financing options because Despite this growing interest in, in Charlton Athletic and despite our hope that uh, we will be able to hand everything over to, uh, to a new owner, you know, our obligations as directors force us to think a little bit in the future and to be a little bit, uh, let's say, pessimistic. So we're safe for August. We're working on, on schemes, ways be safe for September and October as well. But we need to be very, very cautious when we, when we start something because, you know, if the situation is dramatically going to change for the, for, for the best, uh, we want to hold on as, uh, as much as possible.
yeah, of course. Um, some time ago, the EFL released a statement about the situation, um, and they used a phrase of uh, the club are aware of the, um, the consequences uh, if the ownership situation isn't resolved. Um, a lot of people took that as being we wouldn't be able to compete in in their competition. Um, did they mean that, or was it was it more to do with the embargo we're under now? Was 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 that the consequence that they were talking about? My personal opinion was that they were referring to, to the embargo because this is uh, tightening the embargo is the hardest the regulations on change of ownership mm-hmm. um, can go. Uh, however, I did ask, uh, I did formally ask this, this question from, from the EFL, uh, you know, come September 12th and we don't have an approved owner in the EFL's eyes what exactly are we facing so that we can prepare our actions in in respect to this uh, but we haven't yet uh, received a, a formal confirmation but we are in in communication in real-time communication with with the efl uh, they know exactly what is what is happening in the club not just with possible takeovers but with with cash flows registrations contracts and uh, and then so on. I mean, is it, is it, I mean, can we just assume as soon as the, the ownership is resolved and the takeover is completed, is that the point that the embargo immediately gets lifted? There's no process before that? That's what we're hoping. The rules, the rules unfortunately, the rules aren't very clear, you know, on, on timelines and, and, and processes. Mm-hmm. So we can, only, we can only speculate on that. But, and, I don't want to bring Barry up, you know, when, when discussing Charlton, but I've read the Barry report countless times and I've seen that Barry was at the beginning of the season in a far, far worse situation than, than Charlton. Mm-hmm. He was more or less under a CVA and there were a lot of, sorry, there were a lot of players, unpaid players, yet they they still had a lot of second and third chances you know they had their games postponed mm-hmm. and uh, they, they 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 got a lot of a lot of leeway whereas we are in a far better situation everyone is paid we're not under a cba uh, we have sensible actual people interested in uh, in getting the club people who are aware of of its current situation and and liabilities so I don't see any reason why we shouldn't be optimistic. Well, you know, optimistic being at this moment, yeah. the club will survive in in a decent uh, in a decent manner. Uh, you, you mentioned Barry there. Obviously, it's a, it's a name that keeps coming up. Um, but of course, with the Barry situation, there are a lot of individuals um, who popped up there, who have popped up at Charlton. Um, you know, Chris Farnell being one of those people who who is no longer with us. Or can you at least clarify that he's no longer with us? I know that we, we he stopped his involvement as as club lawyer, um, but is is that is that as far as it goes now with someone like Chris Farnell? Uh, in, in in what way as far as it goes? Um, well, with his involvement with Paul Elliott and and the injunction and and all that kind of stuff, I mean, is he involved in that side of stuff? And if if Paul Elliott was to win that injunction, did he then come back as club lawyer? You know, all that kind of stuff. No. Yeah, unfortunately, I can only confirm that uh, he is no longer with the club right. or with other people associated to, to the club ownership, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. Um, I, I cannot comment on whether he is representing Paul Elliott or what his connection with Paul Elliott actually is, because this is tied up with, with, the, ongoing, uh, with the ongoing legal proceedings. Probably when all of that is going to be on public record, um, it will be available to everyone. Right. Okay. You mentioned the, uh, the the Sheffield Wednesday situation a moment ago. Um, obviously, you know, a lot of frustration surrounding that, in, including the fans um, who might have seen it as unfair. Um, what's the situation with that and, and the situation of the club? Are we, in a, are we in a place to appeal the, the situation? Bearing in mind, it feels like we have been hard done by. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. The, the Sheffield Wednesday decision... And the moment when it came out was very frustrating for for everyone at the club. You know, not just uh, not just the squad manager and everyone in the first team, but the, the rest of the staff as well. 
Uh, we've all had our financial issues uh, this year, and uh, we we know we know how hard it was, for example, for for us to make sure you know everyone's paid because we we wanted to do this. Uh, we got the disciplinary the report behind the independent disciplinary committee uh, last week. So now inside the club, we know what the reasons were for applying the sanction in, in, in that matter. Um, and we are still considering internally if we were to appeal it, uh, if we were to appeal it or, or not. Okay, well, thanks for that. Um, man, I think that's pretty much all the questions I've got. Um, but is there anything, you, you know, what would you like to communicate with the fans who might be sitting at home, you know, rightly concerned about the situation and, and have been for, for a while now? Um, what can you give them in the way of hope for, for the, the immediate and, and long-term future for Charlton Athletic? Yes, well, what, can, what, what I can say is that inside the club, we're all working together as one. We understand exactly what the club means to, to everyone because we, we, we've seen exactly what it means to every staff member and every first team, first team member. And to, to be honest, what, what it started to mean to, to us as well in, in, in these months. So we are working almost 24-7 in making sure what I've said, in, in finalizing this, this due diligence uh, uh, process. Uh, we don't have any leeway in, into what a buyer thinks or what he's able to take on in, in terms of liabilities, but we do have this leeway in, in due diligence in the way everything is presented around the club. So we're really, really doing uh, uh, our best um, about this. The priority has shifted. The priority is the the immediate the immediate uh, the immediate future, uh, because indeed, like like most of the fans have said, including in the the Saturday uh, protest, um, the club's future as as a football club um, is uh, is at stake. Its its future as a company isn't in in, in jeopardy, but. If if you get to think of Charlton Athletic as 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 a regular football company, then probably things uh, went too far to begin with. Um, so this this is what I want to to let everyone know. We're doing our best. Um, we appreciate how the help that has been given uh, by by the supporters. If we will need more help, we uh, we won't hesitate to to ask. Um, if I may be in a position to ask right now of something from them is to to be united uh, to think of of, um, of what's best for the club in the immediate future and to focus all of their you know good thoughts towards uh, towards the first team because there's still the possibility that we re we get into a position in the next weeks that we can aim for for actual, actual for an actual promotion, uh, but it's going to take uh, it's going to take everyone in, into that. Um, we've had some good news from council and from the authorities. Uh, there is strong hope that we may be able to have fans back at the valley towards the end of September. Uh, not as much as they would like to be, not as much as we would like to have them, but there are hopes for, for fans back at the back at the Valley in September. Brilliant. Marion, thank you very much for your time. Um, it's been a, a difficult time for everyone, but um, thank you for, um, for doing your part and, uh, and trying to bring things together. And I hope that we can um, catch up again when things are resolved and the job is done. Mm -hmm. What? I'm not crying, you're crying. <laughs> Cheers, man. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. thanks. Uh, take care.